and to be able to say a word for the Lord. We are continuing in our series study, the Sermon on the Mount, learning to be his disciple. Today, uh, we ask that you turn your Bibles to Matthew, our device, Matthew 5, we're going to look at verses 7 through 12. When you get there, and if you're capable and able, we ask that you will stand for those who are capable and able as we honor the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 7, we read from the New American Standard Version, sounds like this. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecute the prophets who were before you. God's children said, Amen. 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 The word of God. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, once again for your word. We just ask now that we would empty our hearts and minds and receive the things that you have for us. And we would leave here a changed people, never to be the same as a result of experiencing you through worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Last week, last week we started this series and uh, it was really living the blessing. After a lot of prayer and anointing and leading of the Holy Spirit, the Lord gave me living the blessing life part two, <laughs> which is just simply a carry on from our message from last year. Nathan Schaefer said, at the close of life, the question will not be how much have you got, but how much have you given? Not how much have you won, but how much have you done? Not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed? It will be how much have you loved and served, not how much were you honored. Jesus assembled his disciples and got them before him and was teaching them. And we received some nuggets of gold through these uh, week's lessons. And one of the things that just amazes me about God's word, what's so awesome about God's word, is how it all fits together. I'm reminded of the times that I spend in the big city in Detroit, Texas, with my grandmother. And she was a quilter. And grandmother could take clothes and patches of clothing and different types of fabric. And she would cut them up and sew and take all of those little remnants and put together some of the most beautiful quilts. And I can tell you those quilts, I don't know what was inside of them, but boy, that was the warmest thing you could have was one of Grandma's quilts. And they were beautiful. How she took the time to weave it all together and match up all the colors. How it was so beautiful. And that's what God's word is. The more I read it and the more I see it, how God places so marvelously in the Bible that it paints this picture that we get to see it. And it's here in our text today. Last week we discussed the four Beatitudes dealing entirely with the inner principles of the heart and mind. They're concerned with the way we see ourselves before God. The last four, the four that we will examine today, are outward indicators of those attitudes. Those in poverty of spirit recognize their need of mercy and are led to show mercy to others. Those who mourn over their sin are led to purity of heart. Those who are meek always seek to make peace. And those who hunger and thirst after righteousness are willing to pay the price of being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, my brothers and sisters, let us just come to a definition for blessing. Many commentators would say this means happy, but uh, I shared this with the group last week at 8.30, but blessed 
as I've defined it, is fortunate to be in a spiritual state of well-being. A spiritual state of well-being. And the first one that jumped out at us today is blessed are the merciful. Luke 6.36 says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Mercy can be defined to mean beneficial or charitable. But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is described in Hebrews 2 and 17 as our merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus is our perfect example. Christ was the most merciful human being who ever lived. He reached out to heal those that were sick. He restored those that could not walk. He gave sight to those who were blind. He raised the dead to life. The same Jesus had the mercy that he didn't pass up prostitutes, taxpayers, drunkards, the outcast of society. Some of the same people that we pass by on the streets with signs holding up, Jesus invited them into his presence. His circle and love of forgiveness. Do you know him? Do you know who I'm talking about? Jesus Christ, his circle of love and forgiveness is so great. And the more Jesus showed mercy, the more he showed up to Jewish religious leaders. The more he showed mercy, they were determined to put him to death. Jesus' last words from the cross were words of mercy. For his executioners were executing him, crucifying him on the cross. And what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. To the thief who was on his side that asked for forgiveness, he said to that thief, today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. He then looked at his mother. He said, woman, behold your son. To the disciple John, behold your mother. All through Jesus' ministry and even on the cross, he was concerned about being merciful to others. He's our perfect example. And we do need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that mercy is a gift of God. No matter how hard man tries, he cannot be merciful because it is not his nature. It is not natural for man to be merciful. But it is a gift that comes with the new birth from trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. You see, we must also, we must accept mercy before we can understand what mercy means. You see, my brothers and sisters, I can understand mercy because I needed mercy. You see, I can understand why God is saying to be merciful to others because he was merciful to me. I thought I'd have some help today. There's somebody else in here could recognize to the fact that mercy, you've seen God's mercy in your life. And my brothers and sisters, one of the most obvious ways that we can show mercy is through some of our physical acts, as did the Good Samaritan. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan. It's recorded in Luke 10. They're leaving Jerusalem on their way to Jericho. The Bible says that the priest passed by this man who had been beaten. The Bible says that the Levite came by and they passed by this man who had been beaten. But it also says the Samaritan stopped ministered to the man's needs, helped him up, put him on his beast, took him to the local comfort inn, paid the bill and told the innkeeper, if I owe you some more on my way back, I'll pay what is due you. My brothers and sisters, that's mercy, isn't it? Aren't you, don't, can't we recognize the fact that Jesus is a merciful God, that our God is so merciful towards us? In fact, Warren Wiersbe summed up mercy by saying, mercy is a bridge God built to mankind. Mercy is a bridge we build toward others. When we are serving others, we should certainly talk to them about Christ. The result of being merciful is we receive mercy. And my brothers and sisters, the next, the next point is, the next one we're going to talk about are blessed are the pure in heart. The psalmist 5110, David says, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
When we use the word heart, we're not talking about that organ that pumps blood through our bodies. Throughout scripture, as well as in many languages and cultures throughout the world, the heart is used to represent the inner person. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, they got a terrible heart? Not that they were a cardiac surgeon. They just recognized the person and how they acted and said, that person has a what? Bad heart. But my brothers and sisters, it represents much more than just emotional feelings. It includes the thinking process and particularly the will of man. In Proverbs, we're told, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs goes on to say, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. My brothers and sisters, could we recognize the fact that today we have a heart problem in our society? Amen. It's amazing to me, and every day I turn on the TV, it's amazing that I read or hear about somebody has gone out with a gun and just shot up people. Just recently, out in Texas, Eight people were killed just going out. I'm telling you, we got a heart problem. The problem that caused God to destroy the earth in the flood was a heart problem. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of his thoughts of heart was only evil continually. The sixth chapter, man's heart has always been the problem. And the society and the problem that we have today is we have people that don't have a heart for God. We look for all kinds of solutions to solve all of our problems. But my brothers and sisters, can I just share with you that there's only one way a person can be solved of the problems of sin and that is giving their life to Christ. God has always been concerned above all else with the inside of man's heart. When the Lord called Saul to be Israel's first king, he changed his heart. Until then, Saul had been a handsome, athletic, but not much more. Oh, but, but, but the new king soon began to revert to his old heart patterns. He chose to disobey God and trust in himself. Among other things, he presumed to take himself to priestly role offered sacrifice, and then was disobedient to God when God gave him commands to go out and destroy the Amalekites. Consequently, the Lord took the kingdom from Saul and gave it to David. God took the kingdom from Saul because he refused to live by the new, God, the new heart God had given him. My brothers and sisters, all of us who are under the sound of my voice have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life have given you a new heart. He gave the kingdom to David because David was a man after God's own heart. The result of a pure heart is that he or she will see God. That we will see God. Somebody saying, have you seen God? When our hearts are purified, at salvation, we begin to live in the presence of God. As I read scripture and pray, I see thus saith the Lord. I see what God wants me to do with my life. I see the vision, the path that God has set before me. But we first, my brothers and sisters, must understand that we have to have new spiritual eyes like Moses, who saw God's glory and asked to see more. We too, my brothers and sisters, should want to see more as a result of a pure heart. We should want to spend more time in the Word, going to the Word, to seeing what God has to re reveal to us. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, the more I see God, the more I see how glorious He is. I see how great He is, how powerful He is, and how merciful He can be to each one of us. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, I came by today to tell you. It's good to get a glimpse of God. I'm glad that I just got a chance to get a glimpse of his glory when he revealed himself to me. And ever since then, I've been wanting to see more and more and learn more and more so that my heart would be right before God. And next, my brothers and sisters, we're told in the scriptures, blessed are the peacemakers. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule 
in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Scripture contains over 400 direct references to peace and many more indirect references. The Bible opens with peace in the Garden of Eden and closes with peace in eternity in Revelation. All over peace on earth in the Garden was interrupted when man sinned and became um, sin into the world. Jesus Christ made peace and a reality of that sin when he died on the cross. And one of, my, one of the most obvious facts of history and human experience is that peace does not today the experience of our world. You see, my brothers and sisters, there's no peace for two reasons. Two reasons. There's opposition of Satan and the disobedience of man. The fall of the angels and the fall of man establish the world without peace. We don't have peace in our country. We don't have peace in our streets. And sometimes we don't even have peace in our homes. Everywhere we're looking around, we see the absence of peace. We look at our politics and we see an absence of peace. When we look at our country, we see an absence of peace. And what we need, my brothers and sisters, is more peace makers. We need more peacemakers. We are so divided and so divisive in so many different ways. We need a group of people who can come together and look past all of those other things and try to bring people back together. Those people are called peacemakers. First, he is one who himself must be at peace with God if you're going to be a peacemaker. The gospel is all about peace. Before we came to Christ, we were at war with God, no matter what we may believe. Secondly, my brothers and sisters, a peacemaker leads others to make peace with God. If we're a peacemaker, we ought to go out and talk to the whole world and tell them there is a Savior and his name is Jesus. There's so many people going through so many problems in their lives and all of those problems come back to the fact that they do not walk with God. You see, we try to solve all our problems with so many different things. Some people think alcohol will make me feel better. Some people think drugs will make me feel better. Somebody thinks this man or this woman will make me feel better. People are constantly looking for peace and solutions in the wrong place. But can I just share with you today that you'll never truly have peace in your life until Jesus Christ resides with you in your life. Because you'll never be able to drink enough alcohol to make that problem go away. There'll be no drug that will allow you to get over your problems. There'll be no man, no woman, no boy or girl who will ever be able to solve all of your problems. But all my brothers and sisters, can I just share with you that when you trust in Jesus Christ, I'm not going to say that you won't have problems, but here's what I will tell you. He'll be with you right there every day helping you to deal with your issue. But you have to invite him into your heart. You have to give him the steering wheel of your life and say, Lord, I made a wreck of my life. Yes, I ran into a ditch of despair. Oh, but thanks be unto God that when I was in a ditch of despair, I picked up a phone call prayer and called on the name of Jesus. He dispatched the tow truck of grace, pulled me out of that ditch. Those gracious alive. Set me on a new way and a new So y'all forgive me every now and then if I get a little happy talking about Jesus. Ooh. Yeah. We need to go tell somebody about what God has done in my life. I'm not ashamed to tell people Amen. what God has done in my life. Just give me five seconds and I'll tell you. Five seconds is all I need. Jesus died on the cross for a sinful creature like you and I. Accept him and you'll have eternal life. Amen. That may have been less than five seconds. Thirdly, my brothers and sisters, a peacemaker helps others make peace with others. The moment a person comes to Christ, he becomes at peace with God in the world. And we should be at peace with each other. You know where there should never, ever be an issue with peace is in the body of Christ. The Bible says, if you have a trouble with your brother or sister, go 
What you ought to do? Go and make peace with them. Unfortunately, when we have a problem with somebody, we want to talk to everybody about that problem but with them. We should go to that person and tell them that we have a problem and try to solve it. That's a peacemaker. But unfortunately, somebody, not, not, not anybody here, nobody here, nobody here, but there are some people who have a problem. They want to go tell everybody else about somebody else's problem when they should take it directly to them. If there's one place there should be unity is in the body of Christ. Because if God's word is our rule, and we're following that rule, we too will be peacemakers. Fourth and finally, when there are disagreements, we need to find a point of agreement. God's people are to contend without being contentious, to disagree without being disagreeable, and to confront without being abusive. The peacemaker speaks the truth in love. To start with love is to start with peace. And the result of that peacemaking is eternal blessing as God's children in God's kingdom. Peacemakers shall be called sons of God. It's a hallmark of God's children is to want to have peace and harmony. And then my brothers and sisters, blessed, blessed, are the persecuted. Indeed, all who despise to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 Before writing these words, the Apostle Paul had just been mentioned. You go back and look at it when you get home. I wish I had time today, but y'all are already looking at your watches. 2 Timothy. Go home and read that. You'll find out before he said those words, Paul had mentioned some of his own persecutions and suffering that had happened to him in Antioch yeah, through Lystra. And in 2 Corinthians, he gives one of the greatest to me defenses of his ministry when he talked about all he had been through for the sake of Christ. He talked about how many times he had been shipwrecked, how many times he had been beaten, how many times he had been left for dead. This is the man, this is the man that says we ought to be peacemakers. And we ought to be willing to suffer something for Jesus Christ. Save me from Christians who understand what Jesus Christ went through on the cross, but don't want to go through anything on earth. Oh yeah, my brothers and sisters, I tell you what, if I have to go through something, I want to go through something because I'm standing flat-footed for Jesus Christ and saying, thus saith the Lord. Yes, and I can tell you, when you go out into the world that we live in and talk about Jesus and talk about these things, you will be persecuted. And I would rather be persecuted for Christ than live a silent, lip-sealed life because I'd be afraid about what somebody would say to me about carrying the word of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, being persecuted for Christ's sake is a badge of honor. I'm going through what I'm going through because I'm standing for Christ. You may not understand it, but we as Christians should stand flat-footed on the word of God. And whatever comes our way, as a result of that, we should say, thank you, Lord. Yes. Because just as the prophets were treated, just as the Old Testament saints were treated, those people were treated, God is telling us that we will experience the same. So we shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't be a surprise attack when it happens. That's why the Bible tells us we ought to put on the whole armor of God. My brothers and sisters, we're in spiritual warfare, and we need all the soldiers to run out of that door and go say, the battle is on. But it starts from inside. Somebody here under the sound of my voice today may have a battle going inside. That battle could be, I'm not sure that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. And if that's your position today, Jesus Christ shed his blood so that you could leave here today knowing for sure that you trust Jesus Christ as the Savior of your life. The Bible says that it's a true confession of faith you will be saved. 
All of the wrongdoing, all of those things are erased by the blood of Jesus. I don't know, I'm dating myself now. Y'all remember the extra sketch? Some of y'all do, some of young people say, oh, what? There was a little red device and it had a gray screen on it and it had two knobs where you could draw stuff. I never was good at art and I sure wasn't good with that etch sketch but you know the good thing about it is, I did my very best to do the drawings. I did. But it would be all messed up. But you know what I loved about the edge of sketch? Yeah. You know what I, what, what, there you go, I got some, all you had to do was just shake it up. And it would clean the slate. Good gracious alive. Jesus cleaned the slate of my life. Amen. And even today, when I mess up, guess what? It's just shake it up. <laughs> And I'll clean you up. Yes, my brothers and sisters, there's no one like Jesus. Every day. Look, I have oopses, and I just say, Lord, thank you, and forgive me for my oops. And to know I've been cleansed. My brothers and sisters, a decision ought to be made today. Amen. Whatever that decision is made, to accept Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, or to say, this day, I commit my life to fully living for Christ and be willing to suffer whatever it takes. Young people, we stand up for Christ in school. There'll be people who will mock you. There'll be people who will make fun of you. That's the fact. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. Acknowledging we need.